Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to some more Tears of the Kingdom, and today we're going to be talking about the most powerful build in the game. If you guys want to do so much damage that even the most powerful enemies in the entire game get shredded in a couple of seconds, then we've got you covered today. We're looking at a build that takes advantage of all the different mechanics in the game, combining them, distilling them into a single death machine, and that is going to be about weapon fusions. We're going to be taking advantage of the attributes of each individual weapon, the bonuses that allow you to do more damage with them when certain conditions are met. And also, we're going to be stacking that with an armor bonus, as well as, of course, the food buffs that we've all grown to love. So, what we're talking about today is going to be taking advantage of a armor bonus that was existing even way back in the days of Breath of the Wild, but because of Tears of the Kingdom bringing on weapon fusions, things are going to be even spicier than usual. We're talking, of course, about bone weapon proficiency. This increases the damage of bone-type weapons by 80%, and that 80% is going to go a long way. Normally, in Breath of the Wild, using the bone weapons involves, let's say, the Moblin arms or the Los Alfos arms, anything from the skeletons you fight in that game, or the dragon bone Boko weapons that you may encounter along the way. Since those things, or at least the dragon bone stuff, is no longer really a thing for melee weapons, we instead turn to fusions, because some of the fusion materials are also classified as bones, and they will enjoy the 80% buff that this armor set gives. Before I talk about the fusion materials, let's talk about how to get this particular armor bonus in the first place. You can either get it from the Evil Spirits, aka the Phantom Ganon sets. The Phantom Ganon set can actually be found in the three different labyrinths that you can find over the overworld. Uh, the first one is going to be in the Heber region, the North Lome Labyrinth. Then you can go all the way to the northeast and go to the Akala Sea for the Lome Labyrinth Island. And then finally, go all the way south to the desert and get the third place, which is the South Lome Labyrinth. Pretty much all three of these labyrinths will require you to find the shrine in the middle of each of them. There are various solutions for each, and they're the same solutions from Breath of the Wild if you guys have already done that already. But then once you get this particular blessing, they will send you skyward. They will ask you to go to the equivalent of the labyrinth that is in the sky area. There are some nodes for you to interact with. And then once you finish with that, they're going to send you to the depths and fight against a boss enemy. Once you get that, fight against the boss enemy for all three of these labyrinths. Each enemy will give you a piece of the equipment, and then you are ready to go for bone weapon proficiency. Now, if that sounded like it was too long, or maybe too tedious for you to do all at once, you are also... Uh, free to go for the alternative, and that is the Radiant Set. The Radiant Set is also a bit of a long-winded mission to get, and basically what you need to do is make your way over to Kakariko Village. In Kakariko Village, there is going to be someone that needs your help making porridge. Help them make the porridge, and they will give you access to the armor shop. The armor shop, you can buy the Radiant Set for 2400 rupees, which is a fairly high price, but you also need to upgrade each individual piece twice at any of the Great Fairies, provided that you've already unlocked them. And then once you have each piece individually upgraded at least twice, you can also have the bone proficiency there. Personally, I prefer the evil spirit because I'm an edgelord and I love this particular aesthetic, but also you're free to give yourself a bit of a glow-in-the-dark nightlight look if that's exactly what you want to go for. Now, in terms of the actual um, materials that we're talking about here, we're going to be talking about pretty much anything that's classified as bone, and there are two particular ones that stand out. First of all, of course, is going to be the Gibdo bone. For obvious reasons, this is classified as a bone type material. 40 is extremely good, considering that this is something that can benefit from the 80% damage boost. However, unfortunately, this means that the Gibdo weapons themselves, they actually get destroyed after a single hit. So it's a bit of a one hour of power, so to speak. Not very efficient, but these can be found very, very commonly. What you could try doing is just fusing a Gibdo bone to each of your weapons and and switching weapons every time you take a single swing. You'll do a lot of damage that way. But the real bulk of what we want to talk about is the Mulduga Jaw. 32 fuse attack power is pretty respectable. It may pale in comparison to any of the Lionel equipment, especially the Silver Lionel stuff, which are quite common to find all over the world. But the difference here, though, is that the difference in attack power, let's just say you get a Silver Lionel weapon that is 180 damage, uh, when you take advantage of the, say, the Knight's Claymore, and then you get yourself down to one heart, double the damage, you get about 180 damage. Uh, that is a very, very good amount of damage that you're effectively pulling off, whereas with the Mulduga Jaw, it's going to be falling short by about 30 to 20 points, uh, about a 20, 23 point difference, so it's going to be 
um, about 150-ish damage instead. But when you count that bone proficiency, you're going to be doing effectively 200 plus damage per swing. And because it's a Claymore weapon, holding the charge attack is going to be really, really high DPS and something that you will love to take advantage of anyways. It makes a huge difference. Now, the thing about the Maldugo weapons themselves is that you can only get four at a time and you have to wait for a blood moon, blood moon for them to respawn. This actually isn't that bad because one Bolduga Jaw is going to go and last a long way. The way that it works with Tears of the Kingdom and Breath of the Wild is that the higher damage a weapon is, the less you need to actually swing it and the less durability you need to consume with it. So high damage is going to go a long way. Better yet, the Mulduga Jaw, when you fuse it to a weapon, it counts as a crush weapon, meaning that even the armored enemies have no chance against it. You're going to shatter it in one hit because of the sheer amount of damage that you can pull off with this thing. Now, talking about the food buffs, you don't really have to worry about dragon parts. Dragon parts are kind of a luxury. 30 minutes is way too much time to do things. I'm going to be using it for today's video, but the general idea when it comes to uh, fusions or cooking, you could literally get away with four bananas and a glass of milk, and that is going to give you about four minutes of a buff. Enemies die in less than 30 seconds, like the strongest enemies die in about 30 seconds or less, so you really don't need to break the bank. You could just use all the bananas in the southern region, the entire southern region of Farron, right over by the uh, lakeside stable, is potassium rich. There are bananas all over this place, and you can easily take advantage of them and the food items there. The other thing to point out, too, is that recipes, you are limited by how many recipes you can carry at once. So it's okay to go through a bunch of bananas in a single play session. It's fine. You don't have to worry about getting dragon parts, although dragon parts can be a nice bonus if that's what you have. Star fragments may also be a good alternative. That's about 10 minutes, which is still way too long considering how easily you can kill things, but that is an option for you as well. Personally, though, I like to take advantage of the knight's equipment. The knight's equipment, uh, when you're down to one heart, you can get double damage, which is going to be insane when you stack it with the bone proficiency as well. Other things that you may want to consider is Zora items. If you have the Sage of Waters ability, you can wet yourself quite easily, or you can take a swing at Blue Chew Jelly, that'll also count as wetting, uh, that it will double the damage too. Personally, I prefer Knight Equipment because whether it's pristine or decayed, it's still going to do a ton of damage. In the overworld, it goes without saying that going to Hyrule Castle will give you decayed Knight's Equipment as well. Inside of the Lookout Landing, inside of the Hideout spots, there is a respawning Knight's Broadsword that you can also take. But if you want the pristine stuff, I've actually marked down on my map all these places where you can find either Knight's Claymores or Knight's Broadswords. Uh, on the north side of the map, there are plenty of places that you can go. And honestly, because of how much damage you do, you don't even need to constantly go back to this. You can just get repaired in Octorok if that's what you want to do. Um, you could pretty much just take advantage of these and then never think about it again for quite some time and you will have more damage than you'll than you'll be uh, destroying your own equipment with a durability loss it's really really good stuff other weapons of course that come to mind of course there's the royal um the royal claymore i also like to take care of advantage of the royal guards against lionels it is the most powerful anti lionel piece of equipment out there i'm actually gonna uh, do this right now and the thing about this is that, like, when you mount a Lionel, it doesn't consume any durability, so the amount of damage is going to be nigh on ridiculous. It's very, very good stuff. But, uh, yeah, what we're going to do is that I'm actually going to show you guys where the four Muldugas can be farmed after every Blood Moon. There's a grand total of four. They are relatively close to each of the... Um, each of the shrines nearby, so they are all well within spitting distance of each other, and take advantage of that. And we're also going to be showcasing this against other enemies as well, so I hope you guys look forward to that. As far as the health reduction goes, there are many, many ways that you can take advantage of this. You could either use Chew Jelly on yourself, that destroys three hearts per... Uh, Chew Jelly that you strike, or my favorite way of doing things is actually just to go to the depths, step inside some gloom, let it tick down, and then leave. And then you can just use the um, the food buff and you won't have to worry about healing over the one heart that you need to get the conditions. So what we're going to do is that we're going to go ahead and go to the first Mulduga, which is on the far east side, sandwiched in between a shrine and the South Lome Labyrinth that you need to get this armor piece anyway. 
All right, so first order of business is that we need to understand that we are at the mercy of the weather still. This is actually quite easy to take advantage of because as it is with all Legend of Zelda games, once you get the enemy's weak point hit, uh, they won't be able to damage you at all. So it's okay to switch over to the heat resistant stuff, and then once the boss is vulnerable, that's when we can follow up with the damage. As you can see, we got ourselves the attack up buff, so pretty much the amount of damage we do is going to be such high DPS that we're going to kill these high HP bosses before the weather even has a chance to get to our HP. So here we go. Now, the strategy for kind, uh, fighting against the Muldugas is a little bit different compared to Breath of the Wild since we no longer have access to the remote bombs. That being said though, there are plenty of things that we can do. Uh, because of the Tremors mechanic, as long as there's something that can count as a Tremor, it's going to detect that and fight that instead. As luck would have it, we got the apples. Alright, so as soon as he gets up into the air, you immediately want to run over to the boss. Once you're in swinging distance of the boss, immediately switch back over to your Phantom Ganons. Four hits is all it takes. Just like that. Then switch back your Heat Resistance, and then claim your spoils. Now, every time you kill a Mulduga, they'll drop at least one chest with Royal, Guard um, with royal Equipment, so that's something for you to take advantage of if you guys like to do flurry rushes. Other than that, though, collect whatever you need. This is a great way to make money with all the Mulduga Guts, and then move on to Gerudo Town. Once you land in Gerudo Town, you want to immediately turn yourself northward so that you can match up on the map. And there is a little island over here with the four pillars. This is exactly where we want to go. The thing about Muldugas is that they're actually quite easy to exploit the AI with, but the real danger for fighting these things is going to be the enemies that surround them. There are going to be Electric Lazalfos for us to contend with, there are going to be the occasional Yiga Ninja, and of course Electric Chews that just randomly show up uninvited. So we want to make sure we're careful if we're working with only one heart. That's such overkill, but I'll take it. Want to make sure that no one comes out and gets us. All right, here we go. Throw out the apple. Gotta run towards the boss. The moment you bump into the boss, switch back to your armor and repeat the process as you like it. Easy, easy money. But yeah, honestly though, fighting against the Yiga Ninjas will probably be the most difficult part about this entire adventure, simply because they'll just show up out of nowhere. You only have one heart to work with if you're using the Knight's equipment, so it can be tricky stuff. And we'll move on to the next one. Now, over by this shrine over here, it is quite a bit of a ways, and we are surrounded by quicksand in the meantime. So what I would recommend is that if you have some kind of flying machine, that would definitely be very, very beneficial for your pursuits here. And honestly, taking advantage of constructs in general is useful for keeping yourself alive and keeping yourself effective. And I believe there are going to be some Negan engines that might spawn here. It'll be tricky, but we'll have to make do. I am going to have to go ahead and aim for any of these pillars... Take advantage of any of these pillars, and hopefully Yiga Ninjas won't attack us on the way. Let's see if I'll be able to lure them from here. No, come on. Throw it in front of us. Okay, uh, I didn't get the uh, weakness hit, but we're gonna do so much damage that wouldn't matter. Okay, perfect. Again, switchbacks, whatever you want. We're gonna look ridiculous in this getup, but that's okay. Hopefully, no one spawns nearby to ruin our fun. And again, claim your prize. Shoutouts to Mulduga Jaws. 
And then we're going to go ahead and claim our last one. I think the closest would probably be the Southern Oasis, but as long as you know that generally it would be this spot on the map, you're good to go. Alright, so once we land again, just double check your map, make sure you're turning the correct way. Get your flying machine so that we don't aggro anyone on the way there. It only costs 9 Zonites, easy to afford. Or you can go ahead and use a sand seal however you want to get there. Personally, I just prefer taking the air. Then keep an eye out, make sure you don't veer too out of the way. I think it's like marked by a bunch of cacti, but this is by far the most out of the way. This is by far the most out of the way one. Okay, I think... I think we could just go over this hill. Yeah, there it is, I see it. Once the health bar appears... There we go. Run up towards it, switch over. Oh man, we're not even getting heat exhausted from this. Nice. And it's done. And just like that, you have four Molduka Jaws, and these can be used for any of the weapons that you want to put it on. Now, I did mention that the uh, the Gibdo stuff, unfortunately, it does not work whenever you use Gibdo material. It doesn't use uh, work when you use Gibdo material for your arrows. It does not count when you uh, have, let's say, a Savage Line Elbow, and you can't, you know, you will get three times 40 plus the damage value of whatever your bow is. Um, that's going to work, but unfortunately, it does not benefit from the bone proficiency. So... Uh, the only time that bone proficiency would affect an arrow that's fused with a Gibzo bone is going to be if it's a Dragon Bone Boko bow, which is significantly less in terms of damage calculations. It might just be better that you get a Savage Lionel bow and then fuse it with Bomb Flowers. But other than that, though, yeah, that is pretty much it. What we're going to do now, we're going to showcase the power of this particular build against some very, very special enemies. I hope you guys look forward to that. And in fact, I know exactly who I want my next victim to be. Okay, so a very, very fitting way to show off this monster of a build is to take it to a wonderful reincarnation of my favorite boss enemy in the Zelda series, and that is going to be King Gleok. This is going to be a lot of fun. So the thing about King Gleok is that I believe he has the most HP out of any enemy in the game, as well as some pretty, pretty nasty tricks up his sleeve, but we also got some nasty tricks up our sleeve, and we're going to trivialize this boss relatively easily so here we go the moment i see the life bar appear we're going to look at our constructs and we are going to give ourselves some cover this is very very easy to make it's two rectangles attached to a square it's very high technology is what we're looking at right now okay this guy is a bit above us we want to make sure that we got ourselves a bow There we go. Lightning eyes going down first. Make sure you're hitting the eye for that extra damage. And he goes down. Look at that. The highest HP enemy in the game. Down for the counts. Easily done. Easy money. Get all your goodies and move on with your life. Good stuff, right? But of course, we can't have a weapon showcase if we don't test it out against a bunch of Lionels, so let's go. Fight against in the arena. Now, the wonderful thing about the Floating Colosseum is that there are going to be five Lionels for us to fight against, and they respawn every time there's a Blood Moon. Personally, I like to use the wing shield so that I always have myself some bullet time to work with. And also, we have ourselves the Molduga Hammer with the Royal Guards. So this is going to be some ridiculous, ridiculous amounts of damage. Here we go. Our first victim is going to be none other than the Humble Red Lionel. He did well that time. 
Uh, okay, let's see what this flurry rush is gonna look like. We might actually need to fuse ourselves with another weapon. We are running out of durability for this one, actually, because we fought against all those Muldugas. But that's okay, because we are going to instead take this weapon. And then quickly fuse it before the next Lionel spawns in. Oh wait, no, not that one. Perfect. Okay, let's see if we can actually land the bullet time this time. Come on. Don't embarrass me in front of the audience. I'm missing my bullet times today. Once you're on the back, switch over to your Mulduga hammer. able to land a bullet time that time at least. And the nice thing about these respawning Lionels is that they'll all drop the energy charges. See, we don't even need to play even that effectively and we'll still put out some serious damage. There we go. Let us take advantage of the new one that we fused just now. Look how fast that HP goes away. Ooh, better be careful. Running out of durability as it is with this thing. Yeah, these three powerhouses of damage that we have. And the thing is though, like you actually saw for this video how much damage we were able to put out, or how much durability we could spend fighting so many bosses, including the King Gleok himself. And here's the silver. Also, lots and lots of HP to brag about. Oh yeah, wait till the very last seconds. Six hits. Don't even need the six hits. And then we get ourselves ready for the final Lionel. And this one's armored, but like I said, this is a crush weapon, so we're going to do very, very well with this. Assume I don't mess up the flurry rush. Oh yeah, check this out. Once that's broken, in one hit. So much damage. And I broke it on purpose. <laughs> More hits than it really even needed, but yeah. That's the thing though, the amount of power that you get from these Mulduga weapons goes such a long way. Even though the numbers aren't nearly as high as these Silver Lionel weapons, don't get me wrong, Silver Lionel weapons are amazing in their own right, and you should definitely still use them. But if you have time to spare for a Mulduga hammer, and if there's a particular boss that you just want to quickly chew through, like you saw with the King Gleok today, you are pretty much good to go. I haven't even mentioned that the final boss also goes down really easily to this, but for spoiler purposes, haven't made any videos for that just yet. So guys, please enjoy using this particular build. We're going to be using the Bone Proficiency from the any of these armors, so it's going to be either the Evil Spirits or the Radiant Set, and then combining that with your food buffs as well as any of the bone materials. Mulduga Jaws are the best ones, but the Gibdo can be uh, finding some uses as well. But for the most part though, if you're going to make all these preparations, you might as well spend a Mulduga Jaw, and it's totally worth it, worth all the effort as you saw from today's video. So guys, thank you very, very much for watching today's video. I hope you take advantage of this build, and I look forward to seeing some more crazy things that we can pull off with this, because there's so much, so much still that we gotta look at. Take care, everyone.